today we are discussing some topics which are related to the plant biotechnology first we discuss gene transfer methods of protoplast we we know many transgenic plants for example bt cotton golden rice etc so where we have incorporated a foreign gna foreign dna into those plants and so that they have become the transgenic plants so in the case of animals generally we have a well established system that is in vitro fertilization where we can manipulate ovum zygote or the early stages of the embryo so that we can produce the transgenic animals but in the case of plants we don't have such a well established single system to transfer the genes to the plants and because of the totipotency the plants have majority of the cell types of the plants have totipotency so that we can manipulate many types of the cells for example mesophyll cells meristem cells even ovum polem whatever it may be more than 95% of the cells are totipotent so based on this actually it the totipotency facilitated us to develop a, va a variety of trans methods for the uh, pr production of the transgenic plants out of this uh, the plant the plant cells which we use for the transgenic to make the transgenic plants are also vary and apart from this uh, when compared to the animals we have enormous diversity of plant species so we have to uh, develop many uh, transgenic methods because the same plant of a species uh, cannot respond to a particular technique where the other plants responds better and sometimes even the different types of cells in the same plants uh, show a different response to the particular type so we have many plant many techniques for the production of the transgenic plants first we discuss what is transgene so the transgene is any gene or a segment of the dna which is intended to uh, introduce in a different organism so that is known as transgene so here the gene of interest which is to be incorporated into the plant cell is transgene so the gene of interest is first cloned into a vector vector is nothing but a carrier molecule which carries the gene of interest into the plant cell so once the vector is modified using this vector the modified vector we can produce uh, the transgenic plants by using different methods and as we discussed earlier the target cells are more in plants because majority of the plant cells are totipotent and the cells protoplast pollen zygote and other meristematic cells uh, we can use for the production of the transgenic plants if any cell is modified with the transgene or the gene of our interest then the cell from the cell we should develop a entire plant that is known as regeneration so transformation is modification of the native plant cell with the gene of interest so transformation without regeneration or regeneration without transformation is of no value so we need the transformation and from the transformed cell we have to develop the plant that is the final aim of this transgenic plants production today we have <coughs> many types of the target cells to uh, use as a cell for the transformation but our topic is how to produce uh, transgenic plants by using the protoplast so first we discuss what is protoplast so protoplast is a plant cell without cell wall so if you remove the entire plant cell plant cell wall so that plant cell is known as protoplast so the uh, surrounding the cytoplasm only cell membrane or plasma membrane is present so that is protoplast for the transformation methods on the protoplast we need first we need to first purify or a uh, preparation of the protoplast so in general the cell wall contains cellulose hemicellulose and pectins etc so first we have to remove the cell wall so here we use some enzymes 
which digest away the cell wall. So, these are these enzymes are cellulases, hemicellulases and pectinases and the, we have many different types of protocols uh, where by which we can pre prepare the protoplast. If there are more number of steps in the while the purification automatically there is a la m major chance uh, to get a contamination. So, always we prefer the method which is minimum steps to to purify the protoplast so that we can reduce the contamination chances. And for the purific for isolation and purification of the protoplast, we need a, self a suspension. So, this is known as isolation solution. So, this isolation solution con consists of enzymes which digest the cell wall and at the same time we have to add some stabilizers because of to maintain the osmoticum. If you do not maintain the osmoticum, the cells because of the <coughs> water <coughs> entry into the cytoplasm, the protoplast may burst or sometimes if the outside environment, the salt concentration and the chemical concentration is more, automatically the protoplast will get shrinked. So, to maintain the good conditions, we have to add the osmoticum. In that osmoticum, generally we use mannitol or a combination of mannitol and sorbitol or a combination of mannitol and magnesium sulphate. So, these are some of the examples for the stabilizers and after observing the ob after observing the plant cells under microscope, we can estimate how much time it takes to release the protoplast. So, the regular observation of the un regular microscopic observation is necessary to confirm the protoplasts are released from the cells. Once the protoplasts are released from the cells, then we need to isolate the pu pro pro protoplast from the mixture. First, all the contents present in the mixture are filtered through a nylon mesh where a fixed type or a particular pore size is there. Once we sieved the, through the nylon mesh, the filtrate is again centrifuged at very low RPM that is 100 G for 5 minutes. Once the filtrate is centrifuged, we can discard the uh, cell, cell wall debris or any other thing and we can preserve the protoplast. Once the pelleted the protoplast, immediately we have to wash the protoplast again to remove any fine debris. So, in the washing in the washing buffer, we have some culture medium and washing solutions and again after washing the protoplast, again we have to go for once again the centrifugation to collect the protoplast and this centrifugation is uh, at 100 G that is very low RPM for 5 minutes. And we now we have we are ready with the protoplast, the isolation and the purification is over. Now, we, we are <coughs> discussing various techniques which are uh, available for the gene transfer into the protoplast. And here we can see uh, agrobacterium mediated gene transfer, electroporation or electropermeabilization and chemical mediated DNA uptake by the protoplast. Generally, we use polyethylene glycol. So, it is polyethylene glycol mediated DNA uptake by the protoplast and micro injection and the other one is liposome mediated transfer. These are some of the techniques where uh, we use protoplast as the target cells. First we discuss agrobacterium mediated gene transfer. So, this agrobacterium tumefaciens mediated gene transfer remains the most popular and most effective method till today. And this agrobacterium tumefaciens is a soil bacterium. Usually, it infects only the dicots at the wounded parts of the plants. But uh, it was thought that mono, monocotyledons cannot be transferred with the tDNA of the agrobacterium uh, tumefaciens. But now we have well established systems that monocots also can be transferred, transformed using these agrobacterium tumefaciens. So, now, we have well established methods to transform both dicots and monocots too. And here the understanding of the molecular basis of the disease helped us to develop a established methodology where we can uh, produce transgenic plants by using these agrobacterium tumefaciens. And agrobacterium tumefaciens is considered as natural plant engineer and 
it has a tumor inducing plant. So, it is known as T i plasmid and T for tumor I, I for inducing. So, T i plasmid and it is around 200 kb size and in that in the transformation using agrobacterium mediated gene agrobacterium is only to transfer the tDNA not entirely the 200 kb plasmid. So, we transfer only the tDNA and here we can see the plasmids Ti plasmid structure and this is the origin of virulence region, this is the origin of replication, this is the right border of the tDNA, this is the left border of the tDNA. So, between the DNA present uh, the left border and right border is the tDNA. So, left border, right border, uh, virulence genes and origin of replications are the most important parts in the Ti plasmid. So, whatever we make the recombinant Ti plasmid, these four should not be altered. Then we have developed bi binary vectors for this uh, agrobacterium mediated gene transfer because these are the vectors where they can replicate in two different organisms. The first one is agrobacterium tumefaciens, the other one is Escherichia coli. Using the Escherichia coli host, we can manipulate the vectors easily and finally, this vector should be in agrobacterium mediated to get transferred. So, whatever the binary vector we are pre we have prepared, it should be replicated both in Escherichia coli and agrobacterium tumefaciens and these binary vectors contains the left and right borders of the tDNA which are necessary for the transfer of the tDNA and the replication of origin in both the bacteria that is agrobacterium tumefaciens and Escherichia coli and usually these do not contain the vir genes. Vir genes means virulence genes. Generally, if they do not contain any vir gene, they cannot induce the transfer of the tDNA on their own. So, we need other uh, like helper plasmids which can provide the vir protein which is already present in the agrobacterium tumefaciens. Now, first what we have to do is make the binary vector or the plasmid which have uh, t left border and right border of the uh, tDNA and instead of the tDNA, we insert our own gene or our own gene of interest. So, the tDNA is modified. So, that instead of tDNA, we have the gene of interest and the gene of interest has both the borders left border and right border of as in the Ti plasmid and these left and right borders are around 25 base pairs in length and origin of replication we have. So, once we construct the vector using normal cloning uh, procedures, then the vector should be trans, trans, transferred to the agrobacterium. Previously, it was normal agrobacterium. Now, the recombinant agro, agrobacterium tumefaciens is ready with us. Recombinant means we actually modified with the gene of interest. So, now we have the agrobacterium which is modified and the explant. Here, the explant is the protoplast, so the plant cells without cell wall. So, now we have to mix these two, that means inoculating the agrobacterium meat, agrobacterium tumefaciens which is modified and the protoplast. So, this is known as co-cultivation. So, here the virgins, virgins play a role in making a nick at the border region. So, finally, we get a single standard DNA. Uh, nick means only one cut in the uh, one strand of the DNA that is known as nick. So, because of the vir genes, we make a nick there and so that we will get a single standard DNA of the tDNA. So, here that instead of tDNA, we have our own gene of interest and once the single standard DNA is produced, it make a complex with the e, vir E proteins, vir E proteins helps the single standard DNA to enter into the site cell membrane and finally, the nuclear membrane. So, this is the schematic diagram showing that how the virgins helps. So, these are the borders, these two are the borders of the tDNA. The, here, we have to incorporated already the gene of interest. Now, 
because of the V proteins single standard DNA is prepared and this single standard DNA made a complex with the VIR E genes, VIR E proteins. So, now the DNA with VIR E proteins enters into the cell membrane or the plasma membrane finally to the nuclear membrane so that it enters into the plant genome. In some cases the protoplast the transformation is transient transformation that means they may not enter into the integrated into the host genome, but they will be expressed in the cytoplasm itself. So, this is regarding the agrobacterium mediated gene transfer. Then we go for next method that is electroporation. So, here we induce uh, some pores in the cell membrane of the protoplast using electricity. So, by applying the electricity we are making or we are changing the permeability of the protoplast. So, it is known as electroporation. Usually the cell membrane is permeable to only a small molecules or small ions not for the charged highly charged macromolecules especially for the DNA. So, we have to make it permeable to the macromolecules also. So, there we have to uh, first fix the threshold field strength because if you apply uh, high voltage to the cell the protoplast sometimes the membrane may break down that means the cell will die. So, we should not do this because we have to check at what voltage at what temperature or what uh, time duration of the time the membrane holds uh, good for which helps the survival of the protoplast after making the pores. So, that is threshold field strength and the first we have to identify what is the threshold field strength where the minimum cell death should be there at the same time the maximum permeability occurs. So, this is we have to fix by trial and error method of a particular sample. It varies from plant to plant and it, it varies from cells to cells also. So, we have to first fix this by doing different types of experiments and the usually we apply electricity for up to 100 microseconds not more not even 1 second, but it is very short time, but the effect of this short duration electric pulse is very long lived compared to the duration of the pulse. So, the pores will be made and these pore, pores are active for a long time at least for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So, this is the schematic diagram showing the electroporation unit where we can see this is the electric power supply always we, we supply the DC current and this is the Kuwait usually uh, this is sterile Kuwait and single we use single use Kuwaits there and it has a lead and f here we can see the elect electric contacts. So, that when we apply the switch when we apply the electricity. So, through the buffer all the protoplasts get the same uh, electric pulse. So, once we purified the protoplast and isolated then we have to prepare the protoplast suspension uh, for a particular number of cells in a particular volume this is uh, mo th this th this depends on the sample what we have used on the aim of this experiment. So, once the protoplasts are suspended in proper buffer proper medium we give uh, some direct pulse direct current pulses. Uh, it ranges from 10 microseconds to less than 100 microseconds and at the same time the field strength is around 250 to 2500 volts per centimeter. So, this is comparatively very high voltage, but the time duration is very short. So, that we can make the pores or we can alter the permeability of the cell membrane. Then once we give the pulse electric pulse where in the buffer we have protoplast and the gene of interest containing the plasmids or the gene constructs and proper buffer conditions in the suspension. So, once we give some pulses immediately we have to keep the suspension on the ice at least for 10 minutes. It makes the pores open for 10 minutes so that uh, the permeability may be increased and we increase there is an increase in the chances of uh, getting uh, plasmids inside the cell. Then after 10 minutes the cells should be keep at room temperature 
uh, at least for 30 to 60 minutes where the reverse self survival will be more and again we have to wash the cell suspension we have to collect the protoplast again again we have to go for very low rpm centrifugation at for 10 minutes at 4 degrees centi centigrade once we transfer once we collected the protoplast then we have to culture them at 25 degrees plus or minus 1 degree centigrade in the dark so this is regarding electroporation and while optimizing the field strength we have to take into consideration of the uh, many factors so these these factors are the pulse length of the electric current composition and temperature of the buffer solution concentration of foreign dna in the suspension and the protoplast density what we have taken and the size of the protoplast and the culture and selection techniques used for this prot protoplast these are some of the factors which we have to consider while doing this electroporation experiment then we go for chemical mediated gene transfer so this is usually done by uh, PEG polyethylene glycol mediated gene transfer actually uh, uh, we do not know exactly what happens when we ask the polyethylene glycol so the exact mechanism is unknown but it appears to disrupt the cell membrane so that uh, the extra material whatever it is there in the nearby that is in the surroundings they enter inside to the cells as usual we know that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable to only to some ions and nutrients and it is impermeable to highly charged macromolecules and water soluble proteins so again whereas in just now as we discussed in the during the electroporation we can manipulate the permeability here also by using some chemicals we can manipulate the permeability so the mode of action is unknown but it disturbs the stability of the plasma membrane so that the uh, gene of interest containing vectors can go inside and the probable uh, action probably uh, the action is uh, it uh, the peg polyethylene glycol acts as a bridging molecule between the phospholipids and the protein contents so first here we have to prepare the protoplast the purified pro protoplast with us then we have to add uh, some sterile plasmid DNA plasmid DNA means which our gene of interest is there then along with that we have to add some carrier DNA uh, which actually thought to stabilize the plasmid DNA then we have to add 1 ml of the medium with polyethylene glycol so after adding all the reagents we have to incubate the protoplast at room temperature for 30 minutes then we have to transfer all the contents into the sterile centrifuge tube so here we can see clearly that aggregated protoplast so all the protoplast come together and uh, we can see some aggregates so we have to dilute them uh, without damaging any any uh, protoplast so first we have to dilute uh, by adding only 2 ml of the sculpture medium for 5 minutes then again after 5 minutes again we have to add 2 ml of the culture medium and finally like this we have to do some 5 6 times so that individual proto we can get the individual protoplast after dilution properly at 4 degrees centigrade then the first the we have to sediment the protoplast again by centrifugation at very low rpm that is 100 g for 10 minutes at 4 degrees then we have to resuspend in cold culture medium as a washing medium and the centrifuge again we have to do for centrifugation uh, at 100 g for 10 for 10 minutes at 4 degrees centigrade then we have to resuspend and incubate the cultures at 25 degrees plus or minus 1 degrees in the dark so this is after a peg methylated peg mediated gene transfer we have to incubate the cultures in proper medium at in the dark conditions so that is peg methylated mediated gene transfer then the next method is micro injection so even still the modified protoplast from the modified protoplast the regeneration is very difficult it is a major problem for us so uh, an another method was developed and usually uh, we we use immature plant cells maybe the ovum or the flower bud like this 
to produce the uh, transgenic plants, but the problem here is always we get a chimeric plants. Chimeric plants means one cell may be transformed, the other cell may not be transformed. So, that is a problem there. Finally, what we can do is even though we get the chimeric plants initial stages, then we can select the only the transformed cells and then we can go for plant regeneration from the particular cell. So, finally, we get all the transformed cells. Then the major disadvantage in the micro injection micro in the other methods is production of the chimeric plant and however, we can get the uh, plants regenerated from the transformed cells only. So, finally, we get only the transformed cells uh, plants. So, for the micro injection we use a glass micro pipette which is around 0 0.5 to 10 micrometers width and uh, the construct or the plasmid or vectors the suspension is taken in the glass micro pipette and that for this the recipient cells are immobilized to a solid support. There are many methods to immobilize the solid to the solid. So, this is one method where the protoplast is attached to the glass slide or the microscopic slide. So, we can directly inject the, the material into the protoplast. It is the holding pipette method where we apply some uh, vacuum, so that we can hold the protoplast properly and uh, we can inject the genetic material. And the third one is agarose method, where we can immerse or af after solidification of the agar, the protoplast cannot be moved from there, so that we can inject material directly into the protoplast. So, these are some of the methods used to immobilize the cells during the micro injection. Then, the advantage is very high rate of success here, because we take each cell and we directly inject the material. So, there is no chance of non transformants in this case, but the major disadvantage is it is very slow, because in other methods we use almost 10 into 10, 2 into 10 power 5 cells, 5 protoplasts at a time, but here we have to take each protoplast and we have to inject the foreign DNA into them. So, it is very slow and it is very expensive method and it requires mm, highly skilled personnel or experienced personnel to handle the DNA and for the better survival of the protoplast. So, it has advantages, but the disadvantages also more here. Then the other method is liposome mediated transfer. So, liposomes are small lipid bags uh, which are made up of the uh, lipid bilayer. So, we can insert large number of plan plasmids into these sacs. So, first here also we have to prepare a pl recombinant plasmid where the gene of interest is incorporated. So, we have to purify the plasmids and we have to incorporate into the uh, liposome. So, this is the uh, schematic diagram, th diagram of the liposome where in this place we have we have to incorporate the gene constructs the transgene concepts. So, here uh, the liposome mediated gene transfer has more advantages than the disadvantages, because the DNA or RNA it is very much protected from the nucleus di 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 digestion and it shows very low cell toxicity and the stability of the nucleic acids also high due to the encapsulation in the liposomes and high degree of reproducibility and applicability to wide range of cell types. And what are the first we, we see what are the steps involved in liposome mediated gene transfer. First the addition of liposomes to the protoplast surface. So, first whatever we have added the liposomes they have to first attach to the protoplast surface. Then the fusion occurs between the liposomes and the site of addition then the re release of plasmids inside the cell. So, this is the schematic diagram where we can see. So, these are the liposomes containing the gene of interest, this is the protoplast, this is the first step in the second step. So, these liposomes, this liposome is attached to the protoplast membrane and finally, the fusion occurs. So, all the contents present in the liposomes are entered into the cell. So, these are the plasmids, the construct what we have uh, intended to uh, transfer into the protoplast. So, this is 
liposome mediated gene transfer. And in this session we have discussed uh, various methods of gene transfer techniques used for uh, production of transgenic plants using protoplast as the target cells and we have taken the material from these three references uh, the textbook of plant mo molecular biology and genetic engineering the author is P K Gupta and this is another chapter uh, the third one is uh, another chapter genetically modified crops uh, oh, this is the imperial college press at two, it, it is produced at 2003. Now the second session, in this second session we discussed the, the gene detection methods in plants. So in the previous session what we have discussed is how, what are the methods uh, which are used to transfer the genetic material into the plant cell. Now in any case irrespective of the method, or method we have used only some cells are transformed, the other cells do not transfer, many other cells do not get transferred. So, the first aim is to identify the cell which is transformed and first uh, we go for the definitions of this genetically modified crops. So, GM crops means, means so this particular crop has uh, something extra or foreign gene in, in, the, in this plant. So, first we have to detect whether it is a genetically modified or not. Uh, then the definition of transgene, so it is the gene of interest we have already transferred or the inserted into the plant genome <coughs> something, so it is transgene. So nowadays genetic transformation has become an important tool for the crop improvement than the breeding methods. Uh, in any transgene, the gene construct consists of the promoter, the transgene, the terminator and some marker genes. So, we can identify the inserted genetic material at a DNA level or the next level that is after transcription the mRNA or the next level that is after translation the resulting protein or the phenotype or the metabolite produced from the genetically gene of interest. So, we can identify the inserted gene or genetic material at 3 or 4 different levels. The first one is we discuss on DNA based methods. We have several DNA ba based methods, but many of the DNA based methods depend on polymerase chain reaction. So, for the polymerase chain reaction, we need, we need to extract and purify the plant DNA first, then we have to use these DNA as the template in the polymerase chain reaction, so that we can amplify using a specific primers so that the target DNA will be amplified into the million folds. So, first we discuss briefly on what are the steps involved in PCR. The first step is separation. So, first the, the template DNA should get separated into two single strands. So, that, st that step is known as separation. Usually it is done by, it is done around 94 or 95 degrees centigrade. The second step is annealing. Annealing means the specific primers which are around 20 to 25 nucleotides, uh, they bind wherever they find the complementarity. So, we have to design the primers specifically so that they can bind the target or template DNA at a particular region. So, the annealing temperature varies from almost 55 degrees or 50 degrees to 60 degrees based on the sequence of the primers and the composition of the G and C, the nucleotides, the GC content. So, so, the annealing temperature varies as per the uh, sequence of the primers. Then the final step is polymerization or synthesis. So, here we have to use some thermostable 
uh, DNA polymerase because for every cycle we have to go for 94 degrees for at least 30, 30 seconds to 1 minute. So, whatever the polymerase we are using here should be thermostable. Generally, we use TAC polymerase for this method. So, this is the schematic diagram of the polymerase chain reaction where the green color one are the templates and the red color one are the primers which are specific to a particular region on the region on the two DNA strands and these are the uh, building blocks that is deoxy nitrogen triphosphates. In the first step, the two strands are got separated here and in the next step, annealing step, in the annealing step, the pre specific primers have attached to the template and in the third step, because of the action of the tag polymerase, the primers are extended to complete the uh, synthesis of the template DNA. So, finally, maybe around 30 or 35, uh, after 30, 35 cycles, we get some million copies of the cell so that we can visually see on the agarose gel electrophoresis whether the amplification is there or not. So, as we discussed all the DNA based methods are uh, depend on the polymerase chain reaction. In this polymerase chain reaction also we have different types. The first one is qualitative PCR. This means here we see whether the amplified product is there or not. And the second method multiplex PCR based detection methods. Here uh, we can detect more than one gene at a, a single reaction. That means fewer reactions are needed to know many other genes whether they are amplified or not, whether they are present in the plant genome or not. The final one is quantitative PCR. That means we quant we can quantify how much of the DNA is amplified. So, these are the three basic methods of the uh, PCR we use to identification of the transgene present in the transgenic plant, putative transgenic plant. First, we discuss on the qualitative PCR analysis. As we discussed, the designing of the primers is the most critical parameter. If anything went wrong while designing the primers, even though the gene is present in the plant genome, the gene will not be amplified. So, the design of the primers is very important here. Generally, we can use uh, we can synthesize or we can de design the primers with different types of different types of uh, G or DNA segments in the transgene. Generally, to identify the GMO, we use genetic control elements such as cauliflower mosaic virus 35S promoter, we call P35S, or the Agrobacterium tumefaciens NOS terminator. So, NOS terminator. So, if we use these two, we can say that whether the genetic control elements are present or not in the particular plant. So, this is the promoter region, cauliflower mosaic virus promoter, this is the NOS 3 region. So, we can design primers to these genetic control elements or we can design the primers uh, for a <coughs> junction of the DNA sequences. So, this is P35S promoter region and this is the trans gene. So, we can design a primer or primer against the DNA present in the junction or this is the P35S promoter and this is the plant genetic plant genome. So, we can design a primer in this region also. So, this is second type we can call cross border regions and in the third method we can design the primers uh, so that the one primer resp uh, is related to or which is complementary to the plant genome and the other primer is uh, related to or comp it has some complementarity in the whatever the transgene we have incorporated. So, we can design this in many types of in many methods of this uh, primers and finally, once we confirm it is the GMO, then we have to go further analysis whether it is uh, properly located or not then multiplex PCR based detection. In this case, several target DNA sequences can be screened and detected in a single reaction, but it requires careful testing and validation. Then quantitative uh, PCR. So, we can estimate how much amount of the DNA is present or how much amount of genes, how many genes are present in the transgenic plant. So, this is PCR based quantification. So, 
there are two types in this one is after completion of the pcr this is known as this is known as end point analysis the second one is during the pcr that is real time analysis first we discuss the conventional pcr so it measures the amplified products of the pcr reaction at the end end point in the reaction profile so after 30 cycles or 35 cycles finally we get we test the uh, in the on the agarose gel electrophoresis whether how much uh, amount is amplified so that we can compare the final amount of the dna of the two targets the two targets are one is to be one is the trans gene the other is a competitor competitor is the synthetic dna which has same complementary regions for the primers what we have used for to detect the trans gene but it gives a different length of the dna so that we can estimate uh, how much we know the uh, competitor when while we are adding the competitor dna we know the amount so that we can compare how much amount of the uh, genetic material is the trans gene is there in the plant genome then we go for the real time pcr so here we can monitor continuously the PCR products. Generally, we use some fluorometric measurement during this reaction. Usually, we go for cyber green one dye, which gives the fluorescent uh, color when there is a double standard DNA. So, uh, in the real time PCR, we cannot go. We cannot estimate whether it is specific DNA or non-specific DNA. Both the e e any DNA which is double standard, the PCR gives the colors. So the cyber green one shows the color. If you want to go for only specific DNA quantification, we have to use specific hybridization probes uh, for them. So we can go. We, we can estimate. Uh, during the PCR cycle, how many of the uh, genes are present in the plant genome. So, <coughs> then we can go for this is up to DNA we have discussed using the pol polymerase chain reaction uh, DNA based methods. Even in the case of RNA, in the level at, at the level of RNA also we can identify the gene so that where we have to go for the northern blotting. Then protein based methods. In general, we use the amino assays for the protein based methods. So, there, there will be an antibody and antigen, bet, uh, when there is a reaction between antigen and antibody, it gives some color. So, that we have to add some colorless reagents which give a colorful products. So, we can estimate the amount of the protein present in the sample. The protein means this is transcri transcribed and translated into the protein from the target gene. gene. And these amino assays can be highly specific, and samples often need only a simple preparation just before going the uh, just before being analyzed. So, just we can extract the proteins present in the cell, we can do this protein based methods. The first one is ELISA, this is well known method, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. The second method is lateral flow sticks method or dip stick method. The third one is bioassay, that is phenotypic characterization. And whatever the amino assay we are using, we need some antibiotics, antibodies. We have to develop these antibodies. It may be polyclonal or monoclonal. Generally, the polyclonal antibodies are raised in the animals, and for the monoclonal antibodies, we have to use the cell cultures. So, this is the schematic diagram of the ELISA where the antigen that is the protein which comes from the transgene is uh, fixed to the a surface a bottom surface of the ELISA plate then the primary antibody which is which is to be which has to detect the protein present in the sample and this is secondary antibody which is linked to a, an enzyme. So, this secondary antibody detects the primary antibody not the protein of interest. So, the second once the secondary antibody binds to the primary antibody we have an enzyme here. So, we give a colorless substance which can give a colored product. So, we can spectrophotometrically measure this color. So, this is the basic principle uh, involved in the ELISA. So, let then the second method is lateral flow sticks and this is known as a dip stick format also. Uh, this is a membrane structured format here in that membrane uh, two regions are there one capture two capture zones are there the first one captures the bound protein 
that is the protein come from the transgene, the second one captures the color reagent. So, when we dip the lateral flow test strip in the solution prepared from the or in the extract prepared from the protopla the plant cells, immediately the sample migrates up to the strip by the capillary action. The sample flows through the detection antibody strip the and the capture antibody strip. The protein of interest in the sample will accumulate gives a band here clearly. So, this is sometimes qualitative or semi quantitative we cannot uh, specifically say we cannot say specifically how much amount is there, but we can say whether it is present or not and it is very quick when compared to the ELISA. Then the third one is metabolite based or phenotype based this is herbicide based bioassay. So, here uh, it is the example for phenotypic characterization the presence or absence of the specific trait is detected here. So, here so far we have herbicide tolerance tests are available now and these are based on the germination test. So, once the transformed cells are grown in a particular medium where a chemical agent is added or the test compound is added, if they germinate that means they have the particular gene in them. If they do not germinate, uh, they, they are not the transformed cells, but it is very accurate and it is inexpensive. So, these are some of the uh, methods to detect the to detect the gene present in the transgenes. So, first we have discussed DNA based methods where mainly based on the PCR and we have discussed uh, the protein based methods based on uh, mainly ELISA principle is involved here even though we can detect the western by using the western blot, but the same principle appear uh, applies here also as the ELISA, but only thing is we transfer the proteins into the immobilized solid and finally, the herbicide assay. So, this is regarding the gene detection methods in the protoplast and the material whatever we have discussed here is taken from this reference. This is Lina Tripathi techniques for detecting genetically modified crops and products. In the third session, we discuss plant selectable markers and report our genes. Selectable markers are uh, the markers which help us to identify whether it is transformed or not, not by visually. So, this is known as selectable markers and the other one is screenable markers or report our genes is after regeneration, we can estimate whether it is transformed, how much uh, gene is transformed like this. And in, in some papers or in some literature, they say that both are same selectable and the reporter genes are same, the mild variation is there. So, generally whatever the technique we are using for the gene transfer methods, only some, some, some cells are transferred, many other cells do not got transformed. So, we have to select a particular cell which is transformed. So, it the presence of selectable marker gene facilitates us to select this one. Usually the media containing usually the media containing a toxic level of the selection agent if it germinates then we can say it has the gene if it is not germinated. So, that we can assume that the plant cell is not transformed usually the selection agents are antibiotics or herbicides. So, usually uh, the antibiotic regularly what we have used is canamycin. So, when we add the canamycin in the medium, if the gene of interest is present along with the marker automatically the canamycin will be phosphorylated. So, that it will be degraded, it will be uh, degraded, it will not uh, show much effect on the protein synthesis. So, that finally, the transformed cells grow whereas, the non transformed cells die. Similarly, the canamycin is the example for antibiotic and we can use some herbicides also which can kill the plant cells if they are not transformed. 
So, selectable markers the first one is NP2. So, it codes for neomycin phosphotransferase 2 enzyme, which is a bacterial enzyme most widely used selectable marker. It acts as both selectable and screenable markers. So, this NPT2 gene, whenever it is present, it gives a protein NPT2 protein. So, uh, it, it gives resistance against canamycin, neomycin, geneticin, and paramomycin. These are some of the antibiotics where we can get the resistance if the NP22 gene is there. But only problem is the legumes and graminae uh, for these plants, this NP22 is not useful. And we can estimate just by how many seeds are germinating in canamycin medium, or we can estimate uh, the ra by radio labeling the canamycin. So, usually, the, if the canamycin is active, it interferes with the uh, protein synthesis in the plastids so that the plants cannot grow. If it is phosphorylated, it becomes inactivate so that uh, the protein synthesis occurs and the plants will germinate. Then, if you use radioactive ATP, the gamma labeled radioactive ATP in the medium, we can use radioactivity detection by autoradiography so that we can estimate whether the NP22 gene is there or not. Then, the other gene is HPT. It is hygromycin phosphotransferase gene. So, the main advantage here is wherever the NP2 does not work for the legumes and graminae, for the graminae it works better. And when compared to the uh, neomycin or canamycin, hygromycin is somewhat uh, harmful to the humans. So, while working with the HPT gene, we have to do some careful working procedures. Then we go for reporter genes, where they do not confer resistance to any chemical or any, uh, any other agent, but the, pro the products of the gene or the proteins, which can be detected directly. So, the aim of the reporter gene is to visually identify the cells or tissues that express them and to monitor the efficiency of the transformation. The ideal reporter gene should have the these types of the requirement it has to fulfill. The ideal reporter should be detected with high sensitivity resulting from an efficient assay and a low endogenous background. That is, it has to produce a very minimum background and additionally, there should be a quantitative assay for reporter protein activity also. And the reporter gene should be detectable in situ without damaging anything and it should be non-destructive method. Unfortunately, any of the single reporter gene fulfill all these requirements. So, based on the experiments, based on the particular gene, we have to select which marker gene we have to go. The first one, some of the marker genes are chloramphenicol acetyl transferase. It is the first bacterial gene which is transfer, transferred to the plant and it also interferes with the protein sy synthesis of the plas chloroplast ribosomes and it blocks the peptide bond formation so that the protein synthesis will be inhibited. When the chloramphenicol acetyl transferase protein is there in the particular cell, it, it comes from the marker gene. So, it acetylates the chloramphenicol at 1 and 3 positions. So, now it is no longer binds to the 23S RNA and it is safe now. So, the proteins will be synthesized. Only the plant cells which have the cat gene with them, they can grow well. The next one is beta glucuronidase, it is widely using and it fulfills majority of the requir requirements of an ideal bioreactor. Usually, it is known as GUS gene. So, it is easy for the quantification, it shows high sensitivity and it shows sufficient specificity of the enzyme reaction. At the same time, it minimizes the interference with the normal cellular metabolism. So, it is uh, the preferable uh, marker gene. And we can estimate the activity of this GUS protein in three different methods. One is we can use spectrophotometric method or fluorometric method or general histochemical assays also. And at the same time, the background levels is very minimum. That is, non-transformants do not produce uh, more amount of the beta glucuronidase enzyme. And these are the um, substrates where we can use. Uh, we generally, we use X gluc. This is the substrate for the beta glucuronidase. It is a colorless product. When we use in combination with the beta glucuronidase, uh, 
it gives a indigo blue colored precipitate so that we can clearly see the cells which have the trans gene along with the marker gene uh, they appear as a blue blue color cells then the second last one is luciferase uh, so it 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 is based on the bioluminescence we have to many types of luciferase enzymes if the bacteria if if you go for bacterial luciferase uh, it is a heterodimer it is a heterodimer of lux a and lux b proteins if you go for animal luciferases it is only a monomer that is luc when compared to the bacterial luciferase this animal luciferase gives 100 times more quantum yield when compared to any other luciferase and it it produces the luminescence after giving the lu luciferin as a substance substrate in the presence of magnesium atp and oxygen it gives color at 562 nanometers range and it is somewhat unstable so and the color is also we get very minimum so uh, when compared to the other genes luciferase is not at all in majority of the cases luciferase enzyme is not at all using then green green fluorescent protein so this gene is acquired from the jellyfish aquaria victoria and in that polypeptide uh, chromophore is present in that chromophore the three amino acids serine tyrosine glycine or is the responsible for the production of the intense color if you modify the sequence of the amino acids we can get more different other bright colors also instead of green we can get red and blue also here the principle is uh, when the aquarin protein binds to the calcium calcium ions automatically it releases the energy it emits at 507 and 509 nanometers range so but it is unusually stable so it's a very stable protein we can go uh, in green fluorescent protein by using as a marker gene and it can be detected on irradiation using standard log long wave uv light resources and here no need of a uh, substrate or introduction introduction is there so we can we we, we do not need uh, to add any substrate and it is only 27 kd a protein that means very small protein so we can fuse to any other gene any other gene so that we can get the fusion protein and the amino of amino acid replacements is also there here also so that we can go for different color proteins and now we have discussed what are the selectable markers npt2 and hpt and what are the reporter genes for example cat chloramphenicol acetyl transferase and beta glucuronidase and luciferase and green fluorescent protein in this uh, npt2 which gives the resistance to the kenamycin <coughs> that is neomycin phosphotransferase acts as both selectable and reporter genes also and whatever the material we have collected we have discussed here is from these two references <coughs>